I want to start by quoting from a book called The Antidote to Extremism by a person called Anthony Jackson. He says this, students who are globally competent are able to investigate our world, recognize and weigh perspectives, communicate ideas, and take action. They can do more than scroll past world events or offer condolences. They can engage and shape the world for the better. Now, over the last couple of years, our annual GMC here at CSU has become a place where we are unafraid to tackle the tough issues. We've created space where students, staff, and faculty, and speakers are able to engage, interact, and yes, at times, even disagree on various issues as they relate to ministry on a global scale. These conversations are of critical importance as they relate to the ever-shifting sands of the global landscape in which we live. Indeed, I would say the, the Spurgeon-esque call of being equally adept in issues of Scripture and their relation to the world at large has perhaps never been more appropriate than it is now. Because this is the world in which we live. This is the world in which you will minister. And we live in this volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. We have to adapt, as all great theologians have done throughout the ages, the timeless truths of Scripture to our time. Finding ways to innovate, adapt, and persevere in uncertain times has often been the domain of the creature known as the entrepreneur. And now, as Christians, we need to adopt the posture of that entrepreneur. We might call ourselves missiopreneurs. Innovative, adaptive, tenacious leaders, serving Christ in a plethora of vocations and locations globally. Perhaps our mantra ought to be that of the Apostle Paul, who I contend is the original missiopreneur, a tent maker, an itinerant preacher, a philosopher, a teacher, and a community organizer, and a full-time sent one. In 1 Corinthians 9, 22, he reminds us, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. See, we need the same posture that Paul had in the first century, but with 21st century makeover. The world of tomorrow is not going to wait for you. It's already here. So we've assembled some thought leaders from the world of business and entrepreneurship, from the academy, from the church, and from international missions to help us over the next few days. And I want to challenge and encourage you to soak up their wisdom, ask your questions of them, and learn in order to lead us well in the days ahead. And for that, we want to ask God's blessing on our time. And so now it falls to me to introduce our first speaker to you this morning. Before I do so, I want to encourage you, uh, we have a book table right over there, and uh, our, many of our speakers, as well as some of our workshop speakers, will have their books available to you. So uh, I want to encourage you to pick those up, read through them, uh, be prepared to discuss them with the author in person. Um, now, our first speaker this morning is, is Jean Johnson. She, she is the author of this book with a really cool cover, I think, called We Are Not the Hero. Now, she comes to us today from, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where she currently serves as the director of World Missions Associates. She's a graduate of North Central University in the area of cross-cultural communication, and my first introduction to her came a few years ago when I was looking for resources for one of my intercultural studies classes. And I came across this book with this bold cover. And as I started reading this book, I realized that, that Jean was not just pulling from theory or analysis or rhetoric, but from her own story, which was made the reading all the more compelling. She spent 16 years in Cambodia and no doubt learn lessons there that have shaped her views on mission and the majority world. 
And I hope that those lessons, which are deeply practical in nature, will be heard and understood by us today as well. So it's my privilege and I ask you to help me welcome to our stage, Jean Johnson. When I was, uh, well, my birthday was on January 16th. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is because my license expired. And so I had to renew my license. And I knew and was afraid that when I would go to take my, uh, renew my license, you have to take the sight, the eye test, to make sure that you can see well. And I was afraid that I wouldn't pass it, Daryl, and that if I didn't pass it, I wouldn't be able to show up today because I wouldn't be able to get my license renewed in time. Fortunately, um, when I put my head on the thing, I was able to see the letters for a bit, and then I picked my head up and I kept convincing the guy that something was wrong with the machine, that it wasn't me. <laughs> and so he said, well, adjust it and move it. Yeah, I think I'll do that. I'll adjust it and move it. And eventually I was able to pick up the last five letters very quickly, so I was able to make it here on time. <laughs> and I was printing out my notes to speak with you, and I can't even use 12 point font anymore. I had to make it, uh, you want to know? <laughs> 14 point font. So uh, my notes look like 10 pages, not because I'm going to speak forever, but because my font is so incredibly large. Um, I did spend 16 years in Cambodia. And before I start, I want to uh, use the definition that Daryl and others have prepared for this presentation, a definition of missiopreneur. A missiopreneur is someone deeply driven by the mission of God who fervently pursues innovative methods of engaging. And this is what I want to have you pray about this week, to ask God, am I someone who is deeply driven by the mission of God? And if not, how do I get there? How do I become deeply driven? And then to pray over the second part, once I'm deeply driven, God, what are the innovative ways that I can engage this world around me? Today I will be reflecting on the beginning of that definition, and tomorrow I will touch upon the second part of that definition. When I went to Cambodia 16 years ago, I want to share with you a few of my first experiences when I entered the country. So I don't know if you know much about Cambodia, but they had a very serious genocide there where some of their own people, Cambodian people, killed three million of their people based on a, a communist philosophy. It was a genocide. So when I went to Cambodia in 1992, I was going on the backs of a genocide. When I entered Cambodia, I knew that there was still civil war going on, that the communist party that killed the three million people, although they were ousted out of power, when I was living there, they were trying to get back into power. I heard gunshots every day for the first six years I was in Cambodia. But when I first arrived there, I knew what uh, setting I was entering. I knew that there would be civil war. And I knew that there was a lot of gunshots. So my first few days there, there was one particular day that it was raining really hard. And almost instantly, I began to hear gunshots all over the place. So I ducked under the table and I told everybody, this is what it's like. This is what it's like to be in a country of civil war. Everybody hide, get under the table, this is awful. And nobody was getting under the table. And they said, Gene, come out. And I said, well, what's going on? They said, Gene, this is not, they're not fighting. This is not gun exchange because of a civil war. What we believe in Cambodia is that when it rains, that the gods are sending the rains and we don't want the flood. So all people who have guns, whether they're soldiers or just civilians with guns, they shoot up into the sky to get the gods from it to stop raining. And so I said, no, no, you don't understand. Do you know if you shoot? bullets into the cloud, you make more holes and it rains even more. And I began to realize in my first few weeks in Cambodia, I was very far from understanding the context that I was in. 
And it wasn't that much longer. A few days later, I was walking with a Cambodian friend. <clears throat> and I heard this deep, guttural sound. It went something like this. <coughs> and I turned to my Cambodian friend and I said, Wow, that's what Buddhist monks sound like when they're chanting. And her eyes got real big and she said, Jean, those aren't Buddhist monks. Those are frogs. <laughs> I continued to realize, wow, I have a lot to understand in this new context. The third experience was I was walking again in the area, in the city of Phnom Penh. And all of a sudden I heard that sound, the clicking of metal the smell of, of a tire, and realized that a motorcycle had just wiped out and two people were on the ground, and I could see somebody hit their head and was unconscious. I said to myself, from my short experience here in Cambodia, nobody's going to help that man based on the religion and culture. To be a good Samaritan doesn't work there. It's not normal procedure. And so I thought to myself, nobody's going to reach out to him. It's, that's how it's going to happen again. But out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man running towards the guy laying on the ground. And I said to myself, well, maybe this time it'll be different. Somebody will have empathy. Somebody will help this man who's unconscious and his head is bleeding. When they reached the body of this man, instead of bending down to check on his well-being, this gentleman began to jump over the body back and forth three times, like this, like some kind of kid's game. And when he was done, he walked away, and I asked the Cambodian, I don't understand what just happened. Could you explain this to me? And they said, Jean, as Cambodian, Cambodians, we believe that when somebody's unconscious, the spirit leaves their body. And so we have a ritual that we jump over their body three times to bring back, to try to call back the soul into their body. I had realized as a Minnesotan from St. Paul, Minneapolis, an American girl, that I was in a context where I had to begin to pray and say, God, I'm just a babbler here. I'm just like a baby in this culture. Everything that I say and think is just going to be like I'm babbling. How do I bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and uh, make transformation happen in a culture that is so completely different than my own? How do I help folk Buddhists where I have no experience in folk Buddhism and make God make sense in their culture? There was another <clears throat> uh, colleague in Cambodia and I'm gonna tell you his short story, but I'm not going to use the real names, but basically Timothy was a missionary in Cambodia as well. And he would take, on a regular basis, a boat to a place in Cambodia called the Floating Village. And when he would arrive in the Floating Village, he would share the gospel with people that lived in the Floating Village. Well, because he had to take the boat every, uh, constantly to go to this Floating Village, he made friends with the boat driver. And he shared the gospel with this boat driver, and his name is Mit Piep. Mitapiat became to know Jesus Christ and grew in his faith as a Christian. And he would accompany Timothy on his journey to the, fish, to the uh, fishing villages, to the floating villages, when he would share Christ. Now, Timothy, when he shared the gospel, he would share the gospel in the way he learned in Bible school, a linear theological kind of systematic theology layout. You know, here's sin, here's grace, here's salvation. And one day the boat driver said to Timothy, Timothy, I appreciate your presentation of the gospel, but it's not working in our culture. He said, you need to change the way you communicate. And this is what you need to do. You need to talk about ghosts. And Timothy had no idea anything about ghosts except Friday the 13th type movies. He didn't know how to respond to that. So when they kept going to the village, they had met another young man Cambodian Vietnamese, who was interested in Jesus. They had given him a Bible. And this particular day, Timothy and his boat driver arrived in this village to share the gospel. And they sat in his home, 
and the young man had gathered other vi people from his floating village to sit and listen. So Timothy went back, defaulted to his worldview, to his uh, experience in communicating the gospel, telling the gospel in a linear, western, logical way. And all the people sitting in the home against the walls in this home were falling asleep. And eventually, the Mitapiop, the boat driver, he elbowed Timothy and he said, Now, now speak about ghosts. So Timothy said, I want to tell you a ghost story that comes straight out of the Bible of Jesus Christ, the Word of God. It's about a man, Lazarus and Abraham, and when the man died and he was negotiating for his living relatives. Then everybody woke up. The minute he said ghosts, everybody woke up. And they were wide-eyed and they were taking it in. And they listened into the wee hours of the night. And by the time he was done speaking about a true ghost story in the Bible and how Jesus came into that picture and how Jesus understands that people are afraid of ghosts and that there's evil spirits. Then he began to make God known in noble ways in that culture. And by the time he was done, one, that young man gave his life to Jesus Christ. As Daryl mentioned, Paul, the Apostle Paul, is a missio. He is a missiopreneur. He is a model of being a missiopreneur. He was also someone who went into many different cultures, and he started out just like I started out as a babbler. What happens when we go into other cultures and we're a babbler, we tend to want to default to what's comfortable for us. While I'm in Cambodia, I'm a babbler. I don't get this folk religion. I don't get the nuances of the culture. I don't know the difference between frogs and monks. So what I'm going to do is rely on my own culture. Why don't I start an English class and teach Jesus through English? Even though at the same time the Cambodians are saying Jesus is a foreigner's God. So if I teach Jesus through English, am I not just reinforcing Yes, Jesus is the foreigner's God. He speaks English, and you need to get to know English if you want to know the true and living God. Or do I say I'm not going to remain a babbler, and I'm not going to default to my own culture, but what I'm going to do as a missiopreneur is become clever, become smart, become a researcher, watch and observe the culture until I know instead of talking about systematic theology in a chronological, linear, Western way, that I can talk about ghosts and make God known in knowable ways. And I'd like to read a little bit about how Paul uh, was a missiopreneur from the scriptures. And why I read, I would like to give you a listening exercise. What I would like you to do is follow Paul on his journey in a place called Athens. And identify, even write down or record in your mind the progression of how Paul went from being a babbler to making sense in a culture different from his own experience. I will be reading from a particular version of the Bible merely because this version of the Bible lays the Bible out like a play. So the different actors speak and it's easy to catch the story. Acts chapter 17, 16 through 34. So Paul found himself alone for some time in Athens. He would walk through the city, feeling deeply frustrated about the abundance of idols there. As in previous cities, he went to the synagogue. Once again, he engaged in debate about Jesus with both ethnic Jews and devout Greek-born converts to Judaism. He would even wander around in the marketplace speaking with anyone he happened to meet. Eventually, he got into a debate with some Epicurean philosophers. Some were dismissive from the start. What's this fast talker trying to pitch? What's he babbling about? He seems to be advocating the gods of distant lands. They said this because of what Paul had been preaching about Jesus and the resurrection. This stirred their, stirred their curiosity because the favorite pastime of Athenians was conversation about new and unusual ideas. So they brought him to the rock outcropping, known as the Areopagus, where 
Athens, intellectuals regularly gathered for debate, and they invited him to speak. May we understand this new teaching of yours? It's intriguing. It is intriguingly unusual. We would love to know its meanings. And then Paul goes on. Athenians, as I have walked your streets, I have observed your strong and diverse religious ethos. You truly are a religious people. I have stopped again and again to examine carefully the religious statues and inscriptions that fill your city. On one such altar, altar I read this inscription to an unknown God. I am not here to tell you about a strange foreign deity, but about this one whom you already worship, though without full knowledge. This is the God who made the universe and all it contains, the God who is the king of all heaven and all earth. It would be illogical to assume that a God of this magnitude could possibly be contained in any man-made structure, no matter how majestic. Nor would it be logical to think that this God would need human beings to provide him with food and shelter. After all, he himself would have given to humans everything they need, life, breath, food, shelter, and so on. This God made us all. This God made us in all our diversity from one original person allowing each culture to have its own time to develop, giving each its own place to live and thrive in its distinct ways. His purpose in all this was that people of every culture and religion would search for this ultimate God, grope for him in the darkness, as it were, hoping to find him. Yet in truth, God is not far from any of us. For you know the saying, we live in God, we move in God, we exist in God. And still another said, we are indeed God's children. Since this is true, since we are indeed offspring of God's creative act, we shouldn't think of the deity as our own artifact, something made by our own hands, as if this great, universal, ultimate creator were simply a combination of elements, gold, silver, and stone. No, God has patiently tolerated this kind of ignorance in the past. But now God says it is time to rethink our lives and reject those unenlightened assumptions. He has fixed a day of accountability and when the whole world will be justly evaluated by a new, higher standard, not by a statue, but by a living man. God selected this man and made him credible to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard that last phrase about resurrection from the dead, some shook their heads and scoffed, but others were even more curious. We would like to come, we would like you to come and speak again. Paul left at that point, but some people followed him and came to faith, including one from Aeropagus named, and I cannot pronounce this word, so I'm just going to say named dinosaur, because that's the best I can do. A prominent woman named Demarius and others. Were you able to capture the progression of Paul, the missiopreneur? Initially, he started out as a babbler. He was perceived as a babbler. But as he progressed in his meth uh, mission methodology, they moved from calling him a babbler, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. But it didn't stop there. Paul kept at it. He kept looking for the treasures in their culture. He kept looking for ways to make God knowable to, uh, God noble to them in noble ways. Eventually, they went from saying, Paul, you're advocating foreign gods to say, hey, why don't you come into our cultural zone? Come into our comfort zone. And they took him and invited him in to that rock outcropping, the Areopagus, their place of culture and debate and philosophy and religion. They welcomed him in and even invited him to speak. And as he spoke, they went from being dismissive to he's advocating foreign gods to, wow, could you tell us more? We want to know what you're saying. We want to know what it means. And they even invited him back again. And his 
the progression went along. Yes, some people didn't choose, but they didn't choose because they understood and they didn't like what they understood. And some chose because they understood and they liked what they were hearing about Jesus Christ, about the Creator, who has made all diverse cultures and the God of all people. And so at the end of the day, Paul had followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This progression <clears throat> is what I believe a missiopreneur is about. The rise of the missiopreneur is someone who goes from a babbler in whatever neighborhood con cultural context that you find yourself, going from a babbler to making sense in that culture until people can believe and follow Jesus or until they can deny and follow Jesus because they have been fully engaged and they have not chosen. But we, you, me, us who are in the West, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will never rise as missiopreneurs until we experience what Paul experienced when he was in Athens, when he was left alone, waiting for his colleagues, walking through Athens. If we were to revisit that scripture, there's a Acts 17, 16 says, while Paul was waiting for his colleagues alone in Athens, waiting for them to come, he was greatly distressed to see a city full of idols. That's where the missiopreneur journey needs to start. It needs to start by feeling distressed by what you're seeing. Not distressed by looking and saying, oh, these people are so poor, they're so needy, I need to rescue them, I need to fix them. But standing in an area knowing that they're almost, that they're almost there, that there's so much already going on in the culture that they could almost grope for and grab God, and yet they're not quite there. And I'm distressed to know that they're so close, but yet so far. And because I'm distressed, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to move from being a babbler in their context to advocating what seems like foreign gods to them, and I'm going to get to know their culture and present Jesus Christ in a way where he's knowable to them in knowable ways. The rise of the missiopreneur is someone who walks among people until they feel greatly distressed that those people do not know God and then thus make him known in knowable ways. <clears throat> the remaining time that I have with you, I want to share with you my rise as a missiopreneur. How did I become distressed? How did I move from being distressed to action? And I say with Paul, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached some sort of missiopreneur perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for what Christ Jesus has possessed me. My rise to Missiopreneur started in high school. I was in, grew up in St. Paul, Minneapolis, in a middle class white high school, mostly white. Knew nothing of other cultures, didn't con even consider it. As a matter of fact, when I was in high school, I wasn't even a believer in Jesus Christ. I was religious, I went to church on Sundays for one reason only, my parents promised if I, on the way home from church, we would get donuts. That's the only reason I went to church. To be honest, I, I went to a Catholic church, and I would get so bored, and I don't know if you've had experience in a Catholic church, but you stand and kneel at different times, and there's a kneeler that goes up and down. Sometimes when people would stand up, and I knew that they were going to kneel down, I would put the, the kneeler up so they wouldn't know, and then they would kneel down, and yeah, okay, I wasn't really a good kid. <laughs> But eventually my mother um, began to, even in, in the Catholic Church, she, like the Athenians, there were things about her religious experience that, that people could start with, so they began to share the part that she didn't know about believing in Jesus and salvation through his grace. And she became a believer in Christ, and eventually my father, and eventually me. So why I was just getting to know Jesus beyond donuts. All of a sudden in my high school, out of nowhere, three people groups showed up as refugee students. The Hmong from Laos, 
the Vietnamese, and the Cambodian. All three lived in different countries in Southeast Asia. Cambodians were escaping a genocide. The Hmong were escaping Laos because the Hmong helped our uh, pilots and whatnot in the Vietnam War. They were recruited as a people group, not involved in the war. When we pulled out of the war, the Laotian government began to exterminate them for helping America. And then you know about the Vietnam War and why Vietnamese would escape. So all of a sudden, overnight, in my context, in my comfort zone, in what I was used to, showed up three people groups. And my friends began to tease them. Why do they, they have flip-flops on in the middle of winter? Now, I did see somebody walking out there today in shorts. I didn't see one, anyone in flip-flops. But back when I was young in high school, we didn't wear shorts in the winter. You guys are tougher than my generation. But they teased them. They made fun of the smells of the food when they would bring their own little fish dish and, and fermented sauces. But there was something different going on in my heart. Instead of looking at the differences, I said to my friends, why don't, why don't you get to know their story? Why don't you sit down and ask them, who are you? What's your story? Tell me your story. And so instead of shunning them, I ate lunch with them. I spent time with them. I even got a few of their free lunch tickets that they got to subsidize their lunch and was able to subsidize mine too. I taught them how to ditch school. I started an English class for them so that they could learn English. I didn't know this was a missiopreneur thing. I just knew that I felt distressed that they were being persecuted and teased and no one was taking time to say, hey, what's your story? One of the greatest talents of a missiopreneur is just to ask somebody, what's your story? Don't lecture them, don't evangelize them, tell me your story. That's what Paul did in Athens. He learned their story before he spoke. And I started to learn their story and relate to them. But eventually my friends began to persecute me. Ah, I gained a nickname called the Asian Lover. And I couldn't handle the peer pressure, and I became confused, and I just didn't, I was trying to figure out being a new Christian, now being a, a, a cross-cultural communicator, and now my peer, peer pressure. So I severed some of those friendships with the people that I met with. Unfortunately, I did. And then it was time to go to college, and I was afraid to go to college. I was very nervous about it, signed up for a whole bunch of different colleges, went to the first orientation at a community college, was sitting there and said, I'm not ready for college yet. I'm going to go to the next college because it starts two weeks later. And I was ready to go to that school. I'm not ready yet. I'll go to the other college because their orientation is five weeks later. Well, the reason I ended up at a Christian university is because they started later than all those other colleges. I had no interest in missions. I wasn't seeking missions. I saw a few people in the missions major, cross-cultural communications. I thought they were weird. The guy's socks never matched their outfits. I didn't want anything to do with missions. But what I did begin to understand about myself is I was becoming spiritually obese. What I mean is that I was going to Bible school, I had Bible in classes, I had chapel, I had all of that every day, day in and day out, being spiritually fed. I was becoming spiritually obese because I had no outlet. I had no context, no buddy that I was sharing the gospel with, not learning to bring somebody along on my journey to make disciples that make disciples as the worship leader shared. And so one day I prayed and I said, God, could you please arrange for me an atmosphere, something I can do, a context where I will feel distressed again about a people, about people that don't know God, something that I can do. And the very next day after I prayed that, a college mate came up to me and he, he said, Gene, would you like to get involved in a particular ministry? I just prayed that the night before. I said, Steve, what's the ministry? He said, we have a youth group we're forming made up of Cambodian, Hmong, and Vietnamese. And I felt like God was saying to me, are you ready now? Are you mature enough now to cross a culture, 
to enculturate yourself and to take on what I've been showing you. And so I started up again, and I went to the monks' homes this time. I went into their homes to learn their story, and I saw in Minneapolis where the monks would have an animal sacrifice, part of their animistic religion. And I would go home, and I would read in Hebrews. And in Hebrews, it would talk about animal sacrifices, but then it described that, yes, there was a time where people made animal sacrifices, but there was also a new covenant time when God from heaven made the ultimate sacrifice, not even an animal, but his own son, from man, from God to man. And so I prayed and I said, God, who tells the Hmong? I mean, they're almost there, God. The whole Old Testament, they get it. They're giving animal sacrifices. But who's going to fill in the rest of the blank for them and let them know that Jesus Christ is the ultimate sacrifice? And then that's when God put on my heart, why don't you tell them? And then I would go into a Buddhist, Cambodian Buddhist home and see the idols set up, all kinds of idols. And just like Paul, I would feel distress and I'm like, yeah, they, they're there, God. There's, they're, they're on their, they have a religious ethos. They're headed somewhere. But the sad thing is when I would read in Psalms, it would say that idols have eyes, but they cannot see. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have ears, and they cannot hear. And I would say, God, who's going to tell them that God is not a God, that there's a living God that's not made with human hands, but is over our human hands? And then God would say to me, why don't you tell them? Do you know that's the most dangerous question you could ever ask God is why? Because that's where your missio panua relationship will begin. That's where it's going to start. When you start to feel deeply distressed because there's people all over, every context, every country, everywhere outside this university, where they have a religious ethos, they have some kind of philosophy, they're groping in the dark to find God the best way they know how, and you're the person who holds the message to fill in the blank, to help them get to the final leg of their journey of knowing God in knowable ways. Eventually, I, <clears throat> when I graduated from college, I knew I wanted to go to the country of Cambodia as a missio panur, so to speak. But the country was closed. I couldn't go there. You could possibly go to Cambodia. So I started with the Cambodians in my own city. 4,000 Cambodian refugees. And I found a Cambodian family of nine members living in a one-bedroom house. There were beds in the kitchen. That's how tight it was. And I asked if I could move in. And they let me move in, and I began to do life with this Cambodian family so that I could learn, like Paul walking in the city of Athens, the culture nuggets, the language, the story of the Cambodian people. After I lived there, I moved into an apartment building of 30 Cambodian families in the inner city of Minneapolis in a condemned, bat-infested, rat-infested apartment building because I had decided that I wanted to be like Paul. I didn't want to live with my parents in the suburb and drive in and bring the message to the gospel and then drive out. I wanted to be smack in the middle, be one of them. I even made sure my income was no more than their income so that I could, their problems would be my problems. And not all, I didn't come, become completely Cambodian. Not every single one of their problems became my problems as they were refugees. But some of their serious problems became some of my serious problems. And we learned about Jesus together through the problems. I didn't come into their life as a hero or as the solver. As I'm heading to closing, basically, I did that for six years and started a Cambodian church. And after the six years, I got word that I could go actually go to the country of Cambodia. As I was ready to leave, the Cambodians handed me a list of all their relatives. Jean, we've been separated from our aunt, uncle, mother, father, brother, sister since the genocide for years. Could you go visit our family and tell them about Jesus? And that's how I started the next leg of my Missio Panur, is with a list of names. I wasn't going to stop just with their family. I was going to continue on through the network of relationships. In closing, 
from my perspective, and this is, as Daryl said, we all have different perspectives, but if there's anything I would like to leave with your generation, with you right here, is to be a missiopreneur like Paul was. You see, we can, when I ask people who are headed to the mission field, I say, what, what do you, why are you going to that particular place? The answers that I get is to promote justice, to provide clean water, to make, promote equality, to alleviate poverty, to help everybody get a free and fair education. And that's okay, but I rarely hear anyone say, I'm going and this is my strategy. I'm gonna go to that country and I'm gonna get alone like Paul got alone. I'm gonna just push away all the, the cultural international restaurants and all that I can access and I'm gonna get alone. And I'm gonna walk through that city and I'm gonna go to the marketplaces and I'm gonna go to the religious places and the cultural places and I'm gonna learn and listen and learn and listen so till I will no longer be a babbler in that country or advocate foreign gods, but I will communicate so intimately with their culture that I will make sense and that a folk Buddhist can choose God because the gospel came to him. A Chinese man, um, there's a Chinese traditional saying, and I think this is what missions needs. And this person is not a Christian. It's way back in ancient writing but the Chinese writer, philosopher said, go to the people, live among them, learn from them, love them. Start with what they know, build on what they have. But the best of leaders, when the task is done, the people will remark, we have done it ourselves. The way we do missions, I was taught, go, live somewhat separate, Show yourself as the expert. Fix them, improve them. Build on what you, Jean, can bring to Cambodia that you can bring to the table. And when the task is done, the Cambodians will remark, you, Jean, have done this for us. That's the mission story of today. But I challenge you to go, live among, learn from the people, love them, start with what they know, build on what they have, and when you leave, they'll say, we have done this ourselves through Jesus Christ, Daryl.